Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hello, everyone. This is Robin Clare, and I'm the host of Hungry for Answers on Transformation Talk Radio, and I am here on Dr. Pat's show with my very special guest, James Twyman. So I wanted to share that the way that I met James was actually through his books. I was an avid reader of his many spiritual books, and then I became a spiritual author and I am a spiritual author for the Ascended Masters. And the Ascended Master that I was speaking with noticed that I was having that I was having a hard time. And he said, do you need a writing coach? And I said, yes, I do. And he said to me in the meditation, who would you like? And I said, James Twyman, of course. And he said, <laughs> done. And so the next day I woke up and James had sent out an email to his thousands and thousands of loyal people and said, I woke up this morning inspired to be a spiritual author's book coach. And I looked at that and I go, oh, I guess that must be for me. And then I signed on and, um, and James, uh, it was a six month program, but he stayed with me for at least 12 months, maybe 18 to get the book correct. And then he wrote the, the introduction to the book. So, you know, when you, when you, um, put your heart into a book and then someone else is reading it along with you and giving you advice, you develop a connection that is very, very close knit. And so from then on, from that point on, after writing Messiah Within, A Guide to Embracing Your Inner Divinity as with Jimmy as my writing coach, we became very, very good friends. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to James Twyman. Thank you so much, Robin. I do remember that experience very well and the whole journey. And it's so great to see how far you've come with that. And and here you are hosting the show and I'm just so honored to be the guest. Thank you. And this is really what this show is about. It's about listening to your intuition and then following your journey to achieve your destiny. So so James is um, has lived an extraordinary journey as a world renowned New York Times bestselling author, as a musician known as the Peace Troubadour, as a filmmaker. He's the founder of an intentional living community in Mexico, and now he's become a Franciscan brother. So when I was thinking about who could I speak to about this journey, about looking at what may seem like different paths, they're really all part of the same soul journey. And then I'm like, ah, um, James, of course, because I've never known anyone, maybe other than myself, but you even more than me, who really listens and follows where are they going next and taking taking the leap. So isn't it true that in reality, all of these leaps may seem diverse, but they're really all connected to your soul journey? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And one might ask, well, what is the soul's journey? And the soul's journey is ultimately to awaken to the truth and the reality that I am and that I've always been, that I will always be. But we forget and we we build these identities within this dream world and forget that simple truth. And the world and every experience in it conspires to remind us of who we really are, that we are really the essence of love itself. And we do have great guides, teachers, mystics from every spiritual tradition 
that teach us this. But the journey ultimately is for me to say yes, to listen, to respond, and and to allow that journey to take hold. And w- one of the other things, Robin, that that I'm I've been thinking about and focusing on lately are the obstacles to that journey and the realization that the obstacle is just as much a part of the path as anything else. In fact, it's the obstacle that usually builds us up, makes us stronger, makes us more determined. Uh, I I actually just heard a, a beautiful Zen story that illustrates this very well. It's a story about a king who realized that the people in his kingdom had to become lazy and and were not really trying very hard to live their fullest life, to live their soul's journey. And so he decided upon a test. He was going to uh, get a huge boulder. There was only one path that led in or out of this village, of this whole kingdom. So he had this boulder placed right there in the middle of that path. You couldn't go around it in either direction. And he wanted to see if people would work together, if they would be be determined enough to to move this boulder. And one by one, he saw people come and some of them would just turn right around and not even try. Some would just give it a half-hearted try. But he was growing very disheartened by the little effort that people were making until finally a peasant that he had never seen before came along and saw this and he gave it a good try with the shoulder but nothing quite happened so he went off into the forest as the king was watching him the whole time found a good sturdy stick and he came back and he was able to get it up under the boulder and get behind it enough with enough leverage that he was able to push the boulder out of the way and lo and behold as soon as he did he found a bag of gold sitting beneath the boulder with a note from the king and it's important for us to know that that bag of gold is there for each one of us and we just have to realize that the soul's journey and the path that we're walking isn't always easy sometimes it takes great determination especially in the time that we're in now with all the different dissension and everything uh, with covid and lockdowns right. everything it's so important for us to realize that there is a bag of gold beneath it all yeah and i'm reading a wonderful book um sue monk kid's book she was the author of the secret life of bees and she wrote a book called when the heart waits and that was one of the questions but i think you've already answered it that she's talking about the idea of waiting and that we use we think of waiting as procrastination or passivity, but it's really about building passion. And mm. I, I believe that um, this waiting, this waiting is fi- is when we when we come across the obstacles while we're waiting. And so if we can see the obstacles and the waiting as a way of building passion to we finally, when it is the correct divine timing for us to take the next step, but that waiting is so uh, is not an easy thing to do because we think we're we've been told we're lazy or we're being passive, but we're being patient. And so I found it so interesting that there were all these P words: patient, passion, pas- passivity, procrastination. Right? Like there's this year for me has been all about these P words. I just <laughs> find it so I get a little a little string of them, and um, and so. I thought that was just so interesting. So we're going to be going to a break in about a minute. But what I'd love for you to talk with our audience about is what is the secret to setting intentions and then enabling them to come to fruition? Because yeah, we can set intentions or and we can just completely undermine ourselves. Or we can set intention to walk up to that boulder and or our idea is we want to get to the other side and get to where we're going. And then all of a sudden there's a boulder in the road. And how is, what are we going to do about that? Yeah. You know, how yeah. are we going to keep going? What do we need to do? What do we need to listen for? Um, and I just love it because this book came to me because I was reading another one of her books that I, I, I didn't love as much as a book I read before. And I asked my guides, can you send me another book? And when I was interviewing someone 
for the radio show this week, they said, hey, I think you should read Sue Monk Kid's book, When, when the Heart Waits. And I'm like, of course you just said that, right? So these are the kind of messages that we get to help us to be able to fulfill our destiny. So we're gonna take a break now. You're listening to The Dr. Pat Show. This is Robin Clare with my special guest, James Twyman. Hello and welcome back to the Dr. Pat Show and you're here with me, Robin Clare, host of Hungry for Answers. If you'd like more information on my offerings, please go to clarity.com, that's C-L-A-R-E dash I-T-Y. And I'm here with my special guest, friend and mentor, James Twyman. And to reach James, I'm thinking that you would go to worldpeacepulse.com. Is that correct, James? Yes, worldpeacepulse.com or jamesftwyman.com. It'll take you to the same place. Nice, great. So we were talking about a couple of interesting things before the break. The first was um, we were talking about, in this book that I'm reading, about uh, Sue Monkhead's book, When the Heart Waits, about how waiting, when we're waiting for something, instead of feeling that we're being passive or procrastinating that we're really actually building passion and you said on the break that you wanted to to respond to that because you found that very interesting oh for sure i mean passion and and the ability to wait so that we can be filled there 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 is a filling process that takes place but only if we can hold still long enough for that to happen but most of us are taught just to work, act, do all these things. And, and we, we never are able to be filled up with that passion and that, that energy. And that really is the key. Passion, longing, the, these words, they, they sound like, uh, why am I longing for this? It sounds almost like a negative thing, but, but, but passion builds with longing. And, and if I'm longing for an experience of, my own divinity, my own uh, wholeness, and and there's so many practices and and many many spiritual paths that that point to this. Bhakti yoga, for example, which is the yoga the yogi the yoga of devotion. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I'm not one. You know, people ask me, uh, you know, do I believe in God? And the answer is no. I don't believe in mm-hmm. a God. What I believe in is only God. And there's, yeah. that's a big difference. That's all there is. Divinity, the divine holiness, grace, that's all there is. And so it's not like a personalized deity that is somewhere outside of me. It's the air that I breathe. It's, it's everything that I perceive. And, and to long for the experience of oneness with that, it comes from the holding still and the being filled mm-hmm. with passion and so I just love what you shared before because it, I yeah. think it speaks directly to the experience. And that really is what we're here for, Robin, as you know. We're not here to get more information. We're not here to learn more stuff uh, right. or to right. gather more goods. It's about goodness. It's about being a- able to be filled with, with this life uh, and this, this liveliness that allows us to, to have an experience that is wholly unlike anything we've ever known before or what saint paul would call the peace that surpasses understanding to experience something that is not of this but is of this transcendent reality that's all around us yeah and so on us in a similar way james and i both decided to follow the spiritual path not just um as a student but to follow it as a teacher and an author and to to share share the information and so it it always has been a matter of degrees of understanding and degrees of stepping back and certainly degrees of healing um and a lot of the a lot of times you talked about obstacles i think the obstacles truly come in the way um when we're not ready quite yet to take the next step on the journey and then I'm sure you've seen it in your life. As soon as the obstacle is removed, 
because you've come to some level of understanding in your life, you've healed some significant trauma, or you've met the right people that can actually make it happen, all of a sudden, it's just right there. Whatever you're, you intended to happen is right there. I love this idea of the feminine energy. So we're comprised of masculine and feminine energy. The feminine is the creatrix. She's the one that creates the ideas and you know, sets everything in motion, like let's do this. And then the masculine is the provider, just like in many, in many cultures. And so when the feminine is holding uh, her standards with, with absolute integrity and, and sufficiently waiting with patience, the masculine's like, oh, my queen, what can I bring you? And then, yeah. and, then the, wow. and then whatever you most desire comes to you. So for those that are interested in filling their, fulfilling their, their, um, their mission on this earth, you have to learn to wait. You have to learn patience. You have to learn to understand obstacles. So can you talk a little bit more about this, what you've been learning about obstacles on the path? Sure. First of all, the, the, the feminine and the masculine balance, as you said, is so important. It, it is the, the feminine that, that not only initiates, but also patiently waits. It's the feminine that is filled. That's why it, you know, it is often symbolized as, as a bowl or something of a container, whereas the masculine is that directive energy. But but there is a, a patience and a waiting. And obviously this has very little to do with male and female because we, we have course. both of them with, within us. There is that yeah. aspect of me that needs to wait for grace to fill me so that I can realize I can't do this on my own. On my own, I can do nothing. It's like in the story that I told before with the, the peasant who came to the, the boulder. He tried with all his might to move that boulder but it wasn't going to move. It was bigger than him. What did he do? He went and he found something to create leverage. And with yeah. a long enough stick, you can move anything because you right. can get that leverage and, and, and get something happening that you could never do on your own. I think that's mm -hmm. an important part of this. But we tend to uh, instinctively avoid obstacles, thinking of them as bad or negative but the truth is anyone who has ever done great things in the world anyone who has ever had a transformational effect on our countries our world in general has i've been people who have overcome great obstacles and they've learned that through overcoming those obstacles that they've grown stronger their intent grows more powerful it's like going to a gym uh, i remember when, when i first signed up for a gym, I would go in there and, and I would half-heartedly lift very light weights and, you know, look around and think I was doing something. And then my daughter, who is a, uh, a trainer, she decided to train me. And she got me in uh, with the free weights and she started putting things on there that I didn't think I could handle. And I would say, honey, I can't do it. I can't. She said, just do it. Shut up, daddy, and just do it. <laughs> and I would. And, and it, was, it was hard. And afterwards, my muscles would ache. And I would wake up in the morning hurting. But the hurting, the reason you hurt after you work out is because you've torn the muscles. And now they're going to grow back stronger. This is why we work out. No one goes to a gym just to, you know lift three pounds you you go to a gym to to grow stronger and that's a, a similar obstacle it's not just because it's easy that we do this we have we have built ourselves into a a system of thought that seems impossible to escape we we have chosen to believe a set of ideas and concepts about ourselves and about the world that seems almost impossible to break through but we we have to gather the momentum and the strength so that we can see that the identity is not who i am what the truth of who i am with capital letters i am is so far beyond all of this but but i need to be patient i, I need to be filled I, I need to have all of these other things build 
within me, as we were saying before, so that I can have the momentum to break through into the light, into the experience that we were talking about before. Yeah, so it, when you first started speaking, when you first came on, you talked about the dream state. And I think people would be surprised to know, and this is how I interpreted it, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, the dream state is the day-to-day -day life that we're living. And that what we're here to do is to, um, is to be able to um, know that this is just, where the obstacles live, <laughs> but truly who we are, the I am presence is our own connection to our own inner divinity connected to all of divinity. And yeah. so this dream state, I call it a play almost, the play of my life. And there are characters in my play and situations in my play, and then the play can close and I can move on or I can open a new play. <laughs> But that's how I always look at it, that this I equate this dream state to a play. I actually like so, that. The idea of it being a drama, a play, a stage, mm -hmm. uh, all the world's a stage and we are merely players. And yeah. the thing is, we, most of us, have become the greatest method actors in the universe. In other words, we have bought so totally into the role and the costume that we forget that I am not that. I am not the role that I am playing. I have gotten so into this, uh, this drama that I think that this stage is the real world. And so right. I'm playing my role. I'm, I'm, I'm going through all of the, 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 everything the character goes through. And then there comes a point where the play ends. Now, if I want, I can take off the costume, I can take off the makeup and be who I really am. Or I could be so lost in the character, I stay on the stage, even though the audience has left, I'm continuing to play out this drama. And that is what we do. All the while, there is a door in the back that leads out of the theater. That door is right. wide open. But I have to break first the, uh, the idea that this is the real world. Now, we can go into this very deep if we wanted to, but uh, I, I've been a Course in Miracles student for nearly 30 years now. And A Course in Miracles is uncompromising in saying that this world that you think yes. you're living in and that you're interacting in is not the real world. There is a world beyond, beyond this. And it's just like the stage analogy that if, if I want to lock myself into a limited construct and say, this stage, this character, this costume is who I am and where I am, I can do that and believe it. But this is not the real world. Beyond this world, there is another world that where everything I could ever possibly want or be or have or do is there. But I have to first break the, uh, the idea, uh, the 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 addiction to the, a world that i've made up in my imagination to hide from that i am presence that we talked about before so i think that's yeah. that's what the mystics have always meant what when they when they talk about waking up and 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 illumination enlightenment it's the realization that i am not the character you know mm -hmm. we said before that god is not a being there we we want to personify god because we want right. to be people we want to personify ourselves so obviously right. we want to put god outside of us as well instead of realizing this identity is is a vehicle that i can use to navigate through time and space but it's not who i am the truth of who i am is so much bigger so much brighter so much more brilliant and I have to be willing to loosen my grip, maybe, on that identification so I can, can take off that costume, look at that door in the back of the stage where the light is coming, st streaming through, and walk through that door once and for all. Yeah, and I think for, you know, just for the topic that the show was on about um, listening to your own soul and fulfilling your destiny, 
I believe that the more that you can embrace these concepts that James and I are talking about, this idea of the connection to your own inner divinity and your connection to all divinity, it allows you to, to connect to what is called universal energies. And if we think of the universe as something that is, an, is all abundant, right? that their, their resources are abundant within the universe, the more that you can connect to that energy, step away from your play and go to what is your divine light, the more that you can achieve and the more that you will receive the resources that you need. Of course, that means getting out of your own way, right? Removing the obstacles and just knowing and being patient and waiting, but being able to fulfill your destiny is very, very real. So we are going to take a break. You're listening to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Robin Clare with my special guest, James Twyman. We'll be right back. Hello, and welcome back to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Robin Clare, host of Hungry for Answers on Transformation Talk Radio. And if you'd like to learn more about my offerings, please go to clarity.com. That's C-L-A-R-E-I-T-Y.com. And I'm here with my special guest and mentor, James Twyman. And you can reach James at um, jamesftwyman.com. And so I was thinking this morning, um, James, about another interesting arrangement that happened for us. Um, James was uh, at a conference and I was teaching a retreat and we were both in the same city, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I really wanted to see him, but I couldn't get out to where he was. And so I was walking around Santa Fe and I said, hey, where is the river? I know there's a river here. I, I forget which river it is. And this taxi driver said, the river is just down the street. And as I was walking away, he said, and young lady, and I said, yes, he said, and you need to look at the river from the left side of the street. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, something good's gonna happen. Like that's what happens when you're divinely guided, right? You get like, anybody can be a spirit guide or an angel giving you a message. So I walk down the street and I look over the left side and there's a man sitting in a lotus position with his eyes closed, smoking a cigar. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that's James, that's James. So I come running down the embankment, James, James. And he's like, he looks up, he goes, is that Robin Claire? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it is. And so it was interesting because you said that you were meditating on, that you were looking for someone to help you make the Barn Dance, which is one of my most favorite books of yours, into a movie. And he said, oh, maybe you're supposed to help me. And I'm like, well, maybe I am. But I'm telling this story because we're talking about the secret to setting intentions and then enabling them to come to fruition. So for the Barn Dance, it did come to fruition at that time. But who's to say, right? You were, you've, you've shared with me that you're in conversations again. So let's talk about that, the secret to setting intentions and then enabling them to come to fruition in what I like to call divine timing, yeah. right? Everything yeah. is not just supposed to happen. In, in this book, in Sue Monk Kid's book, When the Heart Rates, she calls us all quickaholics. Isn't that great? Quickaholics, like quick, yeah. quick. Hurry up now, right? When should I do this now, right? But that's not always the case. So I'm going to turn the podium over to you, the, the microphone, so that you can tell us about your, your setting intentions and enabling them to come to fruition. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a real art form because mm -hmm. on one hand, it's about setting a very strong, passionate, spirit-filled intention putting it into motion however you can and then letting it go yeah. and and then not holding on to the expectation that it happened in a, in one particular way and you mentioned the barn dance uh yeah. it's a good example it's my favorite book that i've written it's the one that i had to go deepest to get and it would make an amazing movie and there are there have been a couple of of big hollywood producers that have 
approached me and considered the possibility, but it just never took, it just never happened. And you know what? If it's supposed to happen, it will. I would love to see it happen, but I'm not going to demand that it happened because me demanding or me becoming uncomfortable on some level because it's not happening the way that I think it should happen. Uh, this is the, that being a quick addict. I want it to happen now. Yeah. I want it to happen the way I want it, as opposed to saying, I'm passionate about this. I, I'm going to hold, hold this within that passionate energy, but I'm also just going to let it go. And, and if it's meant to happen, it will. I, I've had uh, many times in my life where projects doing the same thing have taken off and have gone to huge levels, movies, books, whatever it may be. And, and I've had other things where nothing happened. But mm -hmm. that, that doesn't mean that those other things were failures. No. They were maybe setting the stage for something else. Yes, uh, I love and that. Yeah, maybe it's going to happen at some other time, but it's all about expectation, releasing my expectation, playing the game. Yeah, you know, filling with energy and passion, whatever it is you want to manifest. In fact, let me give you another example. Um, okay. So a book I wrote called The Moses Code uh, was a, a big, you know, it's led to so many things. Uh, we just re-released uh, a newly updated revised version of it. Uh, and it was really fun for me to go back and reread it. Uh, we did an audio book through Hay House for the Moses Code. Uh, and I remembered what initiated the energy. It was when I was watching a movie that was pretty popular at that time. Uh, and that movie, on one hand, I, I recognize it was a very well done movie, but I also recognize that it was not exactly the whole story and that people were going to get tripped up on it if they didn't yes. get the whole story. And the book or the movie rather was The Secret, mm -hmm. very popular movie. And, and, and I said, I'm feeling inspired to, to bring this from the ego's law of attraction based upon what I want and bring it back into the soul's law of attraction, which is based on what I am, the I am presence within me. So I began writing the book and we also began making a movie. And I worked on that movie, that documentary for a year. And by the time I thought I had it done, it was gonna be released in about five or 600 theaters and churches. Uh, we already had about 300 of them ready it was about a month and a half away from release and i took it to la and i showed it to uh three people one of whom was debbie ford a dear friend of mine who was in the movie nice. and then two other men who were filmmakers and they watched it now remember i've been working on this for a year <laughs> and i just want to be done with it honestly and i they watch it and i'm hoping that they're going to just rave and tell me how great it is but all three of them looked at me and said it's okay. <laughs> Not what I was hoping. And I said, well, okay. And one of them, one of these men, filmmakers said, he said, I haven't had two weeks off for a few years, but I have nothing going for the next two weeks. And if you want, I'll work with you day and night. And I think in two weeks, we could pull this together and it would be an extraordinary movie. It was a hard decision because, as I said, I just kind of wanted to be done and maybe it was good enough. But I knew that 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 wasn't where I wanted to leave this. So I said yes. And yeah. we worked day and night for two weeks. We worked so hard. We ended up reshooting 70 percent of that film in two weeks. We re-edited 100 percent, rescored 100 percent. It was, for the most part, a different movie. And and he was right. I'm still so thrilled with that film, which anyone can now see on. Yeah, on, if you just go to YouTube and type in the Moses Code, you can watch it for free. And yeah. but the, the 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 but the the thing at the end, which brings it all together, is the fact that the man who did that with me, his name is Drew Harriet, and he was the director of The Secret. So this yeah, whole thing great. starts with me knowing that the secret didn't tell the whole story, wanting to take it to the next level. And the man who helped me do that was the director. 
the universe will surprise us. And that's just a good example of a time in which I thought I was doing one thing and something else came about that was just the perfect ending. So I'm so grateful to Drew. I'm so grateful for everyone that helped make that movie the beautiful experience that it was. Yeah, and I, I want to share with the audience. Um, so James was my writing coach on Messiah Within. And he had me write the book over three times, begin again. And at the fourth time, he said to me, you, you don't hate me, do you? <laughs> and I said, actually, I hated you the first three times. But the fourth <laughs> time, I think, is the one that's right. I think that if I don't do what you're suggesting to me to do in this fourth rewrite, it, it, the book will have less meaning. And so that, that was just something, you know, something that we did. And I want to share with the audience, when you have a passion and when you're trying to, defi to follow your purpose, you've got to be willing to fix things. As James and I have just shared, you have to be willing to take a step back and say, is this for my greatest, highest, and best good? For myself, for my clients, for humanity? What am I doing? Am I doing, am I doing the right thing? Do I need to shift? And honestly, when you are open to that, the shifts arrive very, very quickly. Grace is around us 24 seven. It's just a matter of opening our hearts to receive it. And it could be the grace of knowing how to fix something to make it more beneficial for, for your audience. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah, in yeah. fact, you're, you're hitting on a key, very important subject, which is humility. Humility is one of those forgotten experiences so often in, in this field in particular, mm -hmm. because we want to think that we have the answer. We want to believe that we know what to do and no one's going to tell me, but humility is what opens the door to even greater creativity and greater accomplishment. We have to realize that I need to ask for help. I don't know, yes. but, it, but if I can just hold still and, and rest in that place where I can be shown and guided and helped, I'm going to achieve far greater things than I could ever achieve on my own. Miracles are gonna happen around me that would never have happened if I hadn't stepped back into that place. So I'm really glad that you brought up brought that up because so often we're just like I can do this and um, well the truth is on our own we can do nothing but but if we're humble right. enough to listen and to follow what we hear everything will be done through us yeah and in in uh, in my last book feast and famine it was the story uh, working with um, the Holy Spirit Sophia to um, talk about the idea that what we're really addicted to on this planet is suffering and, and how to get out of that by welcoming grace into our lives. And she said, you have to tell your story of your addiction. And so I wrote the book the first time, but I didn't have an ending because I was still in addiction. So then I had to go back. Once I came into recovery, I had to go back and rewrite the book from a place of recovery. And boy, what a mm. difference a place from addiction and a place of recovery but then that also led to me becoming a recovery coach which then led to me having the opportunity to have a show about recovery and healing on transformation talk radio so there's always this process and and I don't think I would have been ready to do the radio show if I hadn't gone through the process of recovery mm -hmm. And then writing about it and speaking about it and grounding my recovery. And so that's a whole other thing. You know, if you're struggling with addiction on the spiritual path, it's a really, it's a very real thing. <laughs> and, and so you need to heal your life and you need to, you know, own your own transformation. And that too will lead to you being able to fulfill your destiny. Yeah. All of these yeah. things need to work together. 
work together. Like we're, we're constantly in transformation. I call myself a rose. Like I'm constantly peeling back petals to see what's there and how is that helping me on the journey or not helping me on the journey. And I'm wondering, James, too, and your journey this um, to where you are today as a Franciscan brother, I am sure you spent, how long did you spend? Six months in? Oh, in the anchor Iceland. hold. Yeah. 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 I, I was following um, a very ancient tradition, sort of my adapted version uh, called the anchorite or an anchoress, mm -hmm. if it was a woman. In, in medieval times, uh, someone who followed this path would enter into a small enclosure, usually attached to a church, and then they would not leave that enclosure again for the rest of their life. They would live a life of solitude and, and service. And I just felt like I needed uh, to take that time. I was going to do a whole year. In fact, if I had done a whole year, it would be ending in about a week. <laughs> but I decided after six months that I had gained what I needed. And it was a powerful experience. And it, it, it did bring up about um, a realigning with my Franciscan vocation, which I started when I was 18, when I left right. home and entered the order uh, originally. But the, the spirit of simplicity and humility that I received from St. Francis has always been a big part of my life. And so now I'm a member of an Episcopal Franciscan order, uh, also here at our beautiful Namaste Village community here in Ajijic, Mexico. There's so many wonderful things going on. Uh, our community is growing. We, we, have, we went from 11 tiny apartments to two and a half years later having 41 houses wow. or apartments here. Yeah, And it's beautiful. I wish I could take the, my computer out and show everyone because it's such a beautiful place. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been where the weather is the second best in the whole world. It's so inexpensive to live mm -hmm. here. The people, the Mexican people are amazing. And we have a vibrant community. And, and these things just happen. I, I mean, how I found this property and, and began building this it, one miracle after another, none of which I tried to make happen. These things just happen on their own. If we're able to do everything we're talking about here today, hold still, be right. patient, listen, allow, don't try and do this on your own. And then the Holy Spirit or Sophia begins to talk to us. And we hear that still quiet voice that is guiding us very gently in the direction that we need to go. Instead of saying, I know where I need to go, be directed. And yeah. it's, it's such a beautiful way to live. And it's, uh, I would add to your list at the front end, set your intention. Yeah. For, for yeah. what you want, but don't Absolutely. be tied to the outcomes. Let the outcomes unfold, right? Exactly. We're always in a state of unfolding. And um, even in, even in uh, my life here, uh, uh, Jimmy knows my husband, Ori, we were trying to make a decision and it felt like there was like this veil of unknowing in front of me. I couldn't make the decision. And I just said, I need to step back. I guess it's not time to make the decision. If, yeah. if no matter what I did, I couldn't figure out the answer. And, and then I actually energetically felt this veil in front of me. And I'm like, hmm, I'm gonna honor the veil. I'm gonna honor the, un the veil, I'm going to wait. Yeah. I'm going to see what happens. We're going to take a, we're going to slow down, do it slower and see what the universe wants us to do and what's in our highest and best good. Because sometimes we have a plan, but it's really not a plan. Like it's the plan from the quickaholic, right? It's not the plan of the divinely inspired person. And so that's yeah. what we needed yeah. to do. We're both divinely inspired and we both decided to step back and let our lives unfold. So you've been listening to Dr. Pat. This is Robin Clare from Hungry for Answers on Transformation Talk Radio. And I'm here with my mentor, James Twyman. It's been such a pleasure to have an hour with you. Yeah, yeah we don't get this opportunity unless no. I'm coming through Hartford and get to stay at your right. house with you and Ari, then we have time. Yeah, yeah. So this has been really wonderful. Guys, you can catch Hungry for Answers on 
the first and third Thursdays at noon Eastern time. I look forward to having some of you come and listen to me there. And James, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. And I hope to get to Mexico soon yes. to visit you yes. there. And, and by the way, if, thank you, if people want more information, they can go to namaste-village.com. Yes, it's a beautiful website too. Um, you'll learn a lot because <clears throat> this idea of living in intentional community, I think is the ideal outcome for all of us on the spiritual journey, especially uh, for those who have been on it for a while. We, we need each other. So we, we're going to we're going to leave now. But again, Jimmy, thank you so much for spending My this pleasure. hour with us. I've learned a lot and I hope our audience has, too. And everybody take care and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.